Hey everyone, this is an article review. This one came out a few years ago in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. This one was headed by Kevin Hall. So Kevin Hall, you don't know him, he's an NIH researcher uh, in Bethesda, Maryland. And he was actually appointed by Gary Taubes at one point to head his Nusi Foundation. And this is actually one of the studies that came out of this, which is ironically enough. And what they were doing was they were... Um, testing the insulin carbohydrate hypothesis. If you haven't already, go back and watch my video on the um, on that hypothesis. Basically, what it says is, well, actually, we'll just read from here. Uh, let's see, down here, dietary. According to this carbohydrate insulin model of obesity um, that is promoted by people like Gary Taubes, um, Joseph Mercola, uh, who else? Robert Lustig, to an extent. An increased proportion of the diet as carbohydrates results in elevated insulin secretion that suppresses the release of fatty acids in the circulation and direct circ circulating fat towards storage. So it kind of like sequesters the fat inside the cells and uh, the, the body can't get the energy out of the cells. So the body, so the brain perceives a state of starvation. Additionally, the decreased availabil availability of fatty acids for use by metabolically active tissues um, is perceived as a state of cellular internal starvation, possibly through an increased ratio of blah, 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 okay. In other words, uh, so insulin, you eat carbs, it releases insulin, and then the insulin drives all of those carbs into the fat cells, um, but then it can't get all that energy out, so your body still thinks it needs to eat, even though you just consumed a ton of food. So as Gary Taubes would say, um, we're getting fat because we're overeating, which... That doesn't make sense, it really doesn't, but that's literally what he said and why we get fat. A logical consequence of the carbohydrate insulin model is that decreasing the portion of dietary carbohydrate to fat without altering protein will reduce insulin secretion, secretion increase fat mobilization, and elevate the oxidation of circulating free fatty acids. Um, so that's, that's pretty much what that whole model is saying. So what they did, what Kevin Hall et al. did, was they recruited 17 men to come in and live in this laboratory. So they actually found 17 men who were desperate enough uh, to live in this metabolic war where they could measure energy expenditure with doubly labeled water. Um, and then they also gave them the exact, they told them exactly what to eat. Like there was, an, this was airtight, there were there was no room for error. Um, they weren't relying on dietary questionnaires, which is what a lot of studies do. They ask people, so what did you eat today? They're like, oh, I ate about this much. There was a notoriously unreliable. And so the only way to really measure how much people are eating is to just lock them in a room and give them a, um, this like a perfectly measured amount of food. And so um, you have to know exactly what's in that food to know what's going in it. And this is probably the best design study that they've ever done on this. Um, I don't know who they found, by the way, to live in a metabolic ward. I would not want to live in a metabolic ward for that long. And they kept them in here for four weeks. Would you want to live in a ward for four weeks? And not only that, but they, out, they actually had a four-week baseline diet. So they told them what to eat. And that baseline diet was kind of like a typical American diet. It was somewhere between 35 and 65% carbohydrates and some fats and protein and some sugary beverages. I mean, pretty much what a typical American would eat. So they were eating a typical diet and then they put them in this lab for four weeks. Um, they even, they even um, had to sp like not spy on them, but if somebody wanted to visit them, they had to make sure that their visitors weren't exchanging food and drink. Um, so you basically, they basically had no privacy at all during this. So as you can see here, here is the uh, design of the study, four-week base, inpatient baseline diet. So they put them on this um, habitual high-carbohydrate intake for a 28-day run-in period, followed by isocaloric ketogenic diet. So that isocaloric is really important because all they did was they kept the calories and the protein constant. All they did was change the proportion of fat to carbohydrates. So if they were eating, I don't know, a thousand calories from carbohydrates. They substituted those 1,000 calories with fat, but they kept the overall calories and the protein constant. So they were trying to eliminate as many variables as they possibly could. So the somebody like Gary Taubes couldn't come back and say, "Oh, well, the you know, whatever." Now I should say that they didn't spend 24 hours a day in the metabolic ward. Um, they 
they actually had to spend two consecutive days in the ward and then they could go out into the open. Now, one thing I'm not sure how they did was how they made sure they didn't eat anything outside of the ward. That's, I guess, one question. I'm not quite sure how they did it, but I'm sure they had some form of control. Um, but they, this is what they fed them. Energy expenditure baseline diet was basically the same. I mean, they have it down to the exact calorie. <laughs> uh, protein was exactly the same. Carbohydrates. So baseline diet was 300, and then they put them on keto diet of 30. 30 carbohydrates a day. Um, I don't. That's not a lot, is basically what I'm telling you. That is, let's see, 31 carbohydrates. I'm trying to think. That's half, that's 10 ounces of soda. That's it. So imagine getting a little 10 ounces of soda, whatever, however many carbohydrates are in that, that's all you're getting for the day. I mean, I mean, a bowl of cereal would have more than that, I'm thinking. So they weren't eating a lot. Fat went from 93 grams to 212. That's a lot. Um, sodium is the only thing that changed and trans fat went up a little bit. Point is, they kept track of this stuff to the T. I mean, they measured every little variable this i don't know how much this study cost um but finding 17 subjects to live in a ward and to eat exactly what you tell them for 56 days uh, that takes a lot you know you got to be pretty desperate so here it says all subjects were confined to the metabolic ward throughout the study with no access to outside food again i'm not sure um um, how they made sure that they didn't eat anything outside of the ward because later in the study they show that um, energy expenditure went up when they were allowed to get out of the ward and and so that so their expenditure outside of the ward was greater than it was in the ward so I'm not I'm still not quite sure how they did that but um, I'm they, I'm sure they made they they were some way to verify that they weren't eating outside of it that they weren't stopping it you know, McDonald's on the way to have, have some fast food. How did they measure energy expenditure? Well, the best way to do that is doubly labeled water. Um, hard to explain how that works, but it's really the gold standard for measuring energy expenditure. It, it's just, I think it measures the amount of oxygen that you've consumed. Again, I'm not 100% on the statistics of this. I mean, a lot of this goes into great detail. Um, it's all, all you need to know is that they measured energy expenditure as closely or as accurately as they could. Body fat was measured by using DEXA, which is the gold standard for measuring body fat. Again, everything about this study is just so good. Um, if there, I'll just say this. If there were a study that was going to verify the carb insulin hypothesis, it would be this. And if this one doesn't find it, then nothing's going to find it. So let's take a look at changes in body weight. So negative 15 to zero, that was the, that run-in period that I was talking about. They were on that, um, you know, that four week baseline diet. They actually lost weight on that. I think that was a prerequisite to get into this trial. They actually had to lose a little bit of the, bo little bit of the body weight and they did. Um, this is in kilograms. So they started at, I guess that's baseline weight. So they're, they lost about a kilogram before. And so they start this diet at zero nothing, nothing. Then they lose a little bit. Then they lose a lot in that first week. And then look at this, it kind of plateaus. And if you look at this dot here and compare it to the final dot, there's really no change. And this is consistent with what a lot of people experience. They start some new diet and they get really excited about it. And they're like, oh, I'm losing all this weight. Isn't this wonderful? And then they end up hitting that plateau and they get really excited after that first week because they've lost four or five pounds. And the the authors of this study say later, I'm not sure where, um, that most of that was probably water weight. So if you go on a keto diet, you lose four pounds your first week, just keep in mind, you're probably not going to lose that. Uh, you're not going to lose weight at that rate. Change in body fat. So this is with them at baseline. At the end of 30 days, all they had lost was half a kilogram. Um, I don't know about you. That's not very impressive. I can lose half a kilogram in a week easily. And they only lost it in 30 days. Let's take a look down here. Weight loss was accelerated during the first two weeks of the ketogenic diet, but the rate of body fat, body fat loss slowed during this period. During the final two weeks, both the rates of body weight and fat loss were similar to baseline. So in other words, most of those gains came the first two weeks. Over here, you see that protein intake was 
exactly the same as baseline. So baseline diet plus keto diet was the same. Energy intake was was one calorie less on the keto diet than the baseline diet. Um, by the way, if you're counting calories, you don't need to count to the nearest calorie. <laughs> uh, usually not very necessary anyway. Uh, and again, a lot more statistics here. Uh, I wanted to go down, this is just measuring metabolic rate. So respiratory quotient, that's just measuring fat oxidation. You can see a substantial difference after those first few days and then like no change. Same here, um, energy expenditure, there's a slight uptick here and then nothing. So 100 calories and then nothing. It looks like if you go on a keto diet, all the gains you're going to make are going to come in that first two days. Let's look here. I find this one kind of interesting. If you look at this third graph here, fasting blood glucose didn't change at all. That's that's remarkable because conventional wisdom is, well, if your blood glucose is high and you're diabetic, then you cut carbs and cut sugar. Well, that's what they did and they didn't see any changes in blood glucose. So that kind of um, invalidates that whole idea. If you want to lower blood glucose, do two things. Do intermittent fasting 18 hours a day and eat fewer calories. So if you need 2,000, eat 1,500 or maybe not that little, but eat, go down to like 1,700 you know, and only eat in a six hour window. I promise you, you do that for 30 days, you're gonna see um, a change in your blood glucose. You don't need to do keto. Let's see, look at our on change from baseline. Yeah, so blood glucose, that was one of the, um, actually one of the surprising things. All right, let's look at what the authors say. As expected, the ketogenic diet was associated with a significant increases in ketones, yeah, no kidding, fat-free acids, and glycerol. That's just a component in the metabolic pathway, not really important. Fasting glucose was not significantly different. Crazy. Here's another point that's in here. They didn't really talk about this in the abstract. Leptin was significantly decreased during the ketogenic diet period. So leptin is a signal from your brain. It comes from your fat tissue and it tells your brain to stop eating. Okay. So when you feel full, that's leptin working. This was decreased during the ketogenic diet period, which would, which would actually increase your appetite. That's not good because one of the, this is something that Robert Lustig talks about. So you eat all these carbs and that, that interferes with the leptin signaling in the hypothalamus. And then that's why you eat more. This one shows the opposite. Leptin was decreased during the ketogenic diet period. Interesting. I wonder what Robert Lustig would have to say about this. Uh, discussion. This study demonstrated that transitioning from a baseline diet to a ketogenic diet coincided with decreased insulin. Okay which would predict greater fat loss, according to the whole hypothesis. Um, let's see. Our study adds to the literature addressing the perennial question, is a calorie a calorie? Uh, the carbohydrate insulin model predicts that the ketogenic diet would lead to an increased energy expenditure, thereby resulting in a metabolic advantage amounting to 300 to 600 calories a day. Here it is. Our data do not support energy expenditure increases of that magnitude. They only found 100. Uh, so this idea that lowering in, um, insulin would liberate all of this energy from the fat cells and you can metabolize all this and you would have greater energy expenditure, they didn't find it. Unless accompanied by an increase in dietary protein, um, carbohydrate restriction has not previously been observed to increase energy expenditure. Okay, and that's exactly what they found. Studies that use clamp dietary protein have found either small decreases in energy expenditure with lower carbohydrate, lower carb diets, or no statistically st significant differences, and that's exactly what they found. Um, the carbohydrate insulin model predicts a greater rate of body fat loss. Our data do not support this. These mechanistic questions deserve further study. Let's see. It is clear that regulation of adipose tissue fat storage is multifaceted, and this is important. Listen to this: insulin does not always play a prominent role. Meaning, it's not that simple. <laughs> this whole idea that it's all about insulin, you got to lower insulin, don't eat carbs, don't eat sugar, because that'll flood your body with insulin, and insulin will keep all this energy trapped. Well, it turns out that didn't work. So, um, I don't know what Gary Taubes ever said about this. Something tells me he did not repudiate this hypothesis. He will go to the grave believing what he believes. Um, I think he's a charlatan. I think he's in it for the money, basically. 
Uh, let's see. In summary, we found that a carefully controlled isochloric ketogenic diet coincided with small increases in energy expenditure that waned over time, like over the first week. Despite rapid, substantial, and persistent reductions in daily insulin secretion, we observed a slowing of body fat loss, which is the opposite of what, this, what the hypothesis would predict. Therefore, our data do not support the carbohydrate insulin model. Well, too bad. So, which one is better, low carb or low fat? Like I've always said, I depends on what you mean by low carb, low fat. I like to say 50-60% carbohydrates, 25-30% fat, and then 10 or 15% protein. You know, getting enough protein to stay healthy, you actually don't need a ton of it. If you're eating too, it, um, it goes by body weight, really. But if you're 150 pounds, 75 grams, you know. You know, um, I say at least one gram per kilogram of lean, uh, of fat-free mass. So, 150 pounds, and you're 20% body fat. That means you have 120 pounds of fat-free mass. Divide that by about two, and you're about 60 grams of protein. You're not going to be protein deficient, really. I will say though that eating more protein reduces appetite, so it does make it easier to lose weight. Um, but really, high fat, low carb, I don't. I really don't see an advantage here. So I know people are going to watch this and be like, well, I did keto and I lost. Good for you. I'm glad it worked. The problem with it is that it is really hard to sustain that long term, especially as we head into the holidays with all the pumpkin pie and the stuffing and the cranberries. And <laughs> I guess all you can have is the turkey. Um, I, miss, I guess maybe green beans, but you know, those have some carbs too. Anyway, this was such a good study. I've read it a couple times now. There's also a video on YouTube with Kevin Hall at the, uh, there was some obesity conference in Vancouver uh, a few years ago and he reviews his poster and talks about it. And it's actually, it's not a very good video, but if you just listen to it, it's, it's, it's important. Um, anyway, yeah, so ketogenic diet failed. When you put all these controls on it and you measure everything and you keep track of all the variables. It just it doesn't doesn't seem to work. Um, not saying you doesn't can't work for you. Doesn't mean you shouldn't try it. Doesn't mean some people haven't succeeded on the keto diet. But this idea that just eating a ton of sugar and a ton of carbs is what's causing diabetes and is causing obesity. And if you just cut out the carbs, everything will be okay. Not true. Also, if you're interested, here is the article, American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, Energy Expenditure and Body Composition Changes After an Isochloric Ketogenic Diet. I'll put the whole citation um, in the description below, so you can take a look at it. You can get the, um, the abstract, um, and I don't, know, I don't know if you can get the whole PDF. Um, I have my own subscription like my own, my own way of getting these articles, but maybe you can, I don't know. But I hope you enjoy this. I will review articles in the future. If you find an article that you want me to review, let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to check out some of my other videos, my free training, and if you wanna speak with me directly, there is a link in the description box below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.